Hello and welcome back to RC Model Reviews and the first in what will be an ongoing series of videos looking at the subject of long range UHF radio control systems as used by people flying FPV and drones when they want more consistency of control and operations over ranges that exceed that normally provided by the very commonplace 2.4 gigahertz radio equipment and sometimes you really just need that extra range whether it's just to give you reliability which means safety or whether it's because you're working in a tough environment where there's a lot of 2.4 gigahertz noise or or you're flying in terrain or conditions where the 2.4 gigahertz signal just will not provide the type of control you need to do things safely and I'm going to talk a bit about safety because obviously safety is a big issue let's start off by getting the safety things out of the way first thing I have to say is you can't fly your FPV model or your UAV beyond the visual line of sight legally in many countries at all. I think America is the only one where there's no specific rules to stop you doing it because America has said that we cannot regulate, the FAA cannot regulate RC models as such. But even then they've been getting around that problem by saying well if you fly it beyond visual line of sight it is no longer an RC model it falls into the category of a unmanned aerial system and we can ping you for that. Proof? When Trappy flew his Zagi wing I think it was over the university campus and took some video that was used commercially the FAA said a model aircraft is not something used commercially therefore you weren't flying a model therefore we're going to hit you with a $15,000 fine and although there was a court case in argy bargy and so forth eventually Trappy had to pay a fine because the FAA prevailed because they make the rules and they basically you've got to fight the courts if and through the courts if you want to beat them so in reality although it's not specifically outlawed even in the USA flying beyond visual line of sight can get you into a lot of trouble and so why would you use these long-range systems if they effectively can't be used well they can be used and one thing you've got to remember it's very important if there are people from the aviation regulators watching this video as no doubt some of them will be they should look at this and say well how many incidents have we had in the last 10 years or ever related to the operation of model aircraft by FPV over long ranges outside the visual line of sight if they get the list and they tabulate it bend spindle fold and mutilate all the data crunch it up and produce a final figure I bet you that figure's zero I bet you there's been nobody injured I bet you there's been no property damage nobody killed by a keen hobbyists flying their RC models well beyond the visual line of sight using long range radio control equipment and FPV gear that's the magnitude of the risks involved and that's because to get a model reliably flying beyond line of visual, visual line of sight requires you, you, you pay attention to detail and you use good quality gear and you know how to use it and as I have always said when it comes to safety the way to promote, preserve and ensure safety is not to pass a million and one horrible draconian rules and regulations it's to inform people, it's to educate them, it's to tell them how to use stuff, how stuff works how not to use stuff, the limitations of technology that's why you're watching this video, that's what I'm going to tell you especially in this first video where I'm talking about some of the theory and the background and the hows, whys and whatevers of this technology because it's a bit different to your 2.4 gigahertz technology that most people are using now for their RC models and their uh, drones. So let's get on and take a look at the various techno or various aspects of the technology that are involved. And I'll also tell you the systems I'm going to be reviewing because there's theory and there's practice and there's reviews. This whole series is going to try and make this whole beyond visual line of sight thing. It probably will never be legal, but at least we can make it safe because there are people out there who have for a long time and probably will continue to fly beyond visual line of sight regardless of what the rules say. But there are other aspects as well because there are people like myself who are not going to be flying long distances but we want the other benefits that UHF offers. So I'm going to be looking at the, uh, what have I got there? I've got the Easy UHS system from Immersion RC. I've got the Dragonlink system from Dragonlink. I've got the Shera long range system from I think it's Danish Aviation Systems. I've got the Arcbird long range UHF system which is a Chinese system which works a little bit differently to the others quite interesting we'll see whether it's actually as good as it seems because there are some downsides to the way they've set their system up and we've got the open LRS system I've got an orange version from Hobby King because it's really cheap so we'll have a look we'll see does 
is the value proportional, was the performance proportional to the price? So which is the best value, which is the most well designed physically, electronically? Which one has the best performance in so many areas? Because there's so many aspects to this UHF long range gear. I mean, there's not just range. If we just chose a system on the basis of which had the longest range, we could still be in big trouble because as how resistant is it to interference from other users of the 433 megahertz band because there are a lot of them. And how resistant is it to interference from other sources of radio frequency signals outside the 4 point, uh, 433 megahertz band? Because take, take an average FPV model, for example, you've got your very, very sensitive radio control receiver, and right next door you've got an FPV transmitter blaring away at huge power levels, and we're talking sometimes watts, and transmitting a signal that has to be picked up, you know, perhaps in the case of long range systems, tens of miles away. Can it cope with that loud noise in its ear hole? These are things I've got to look at. There is also the other aspect. On the ground station end, you've got a very sensitive FPV video receiver, but you've also got a very powerful transmitter. You've got your long range UHF transmitter. Is that UHF transmitter going to kill the signal to your video system? Because there are all sorts of things like harmonics and spurious emissions. So this is not a simple business, which is why it's going to take quite a few videos to explain all this to you in terms you can understand if you're not a radio frequency engineer and to give you the information, the understanding, the knowledge you need to make an informed decision, not only as to whether or what UHF system to choose, but whether you need UHF at all, because honestly, most people don't need it. Most people get no benefit from it. There are pros to using UHF, but there are also a longer list of cons, a longer list of reasons why you would not want to use it, unless you have specific requirements, which we'll look at shortly. So, without further ado, let's go over to the whiteboard. I'll get into some theory, look at the pros and cons, and we'll take it to the next level. Let's go. Please. Thank you. Pros and cons. These are the reasons why you might choose to use UHF or why you may not choose to UH use UHF. First of all, the pros. Longer range. Well, that stands to reason, doesn't it? I mean, these are called long range UHF RC systems, so you'd expect to get a longer range. And all things being equal, you will get a longer range. But as we know in the real world, all things aren't always equal. And there are occasions when UHF will not give you longer range. In fact, it may give you inferior range. I tested the r Mile c UHF long range system here quite some time ago when I was still allowed to fly here. And I found it only gave me one kilometer of range, less than one kilometer of range here at the airfield. The reasons for that were, well, who knows? But obviously in that case, that system wasn't capable of delivering the kind of range that it claimed to. And I think that one of the reasons for that is interference, which is something I'll cover shortly. There is a lot of interference out there on the 433 megahertz band, and I'll, I'll talk about that as we go through this video. But anyway, so the long range is not necessarily guaranteed, depending on where you're flying, depending on where you're flying and the type of environment you're in. But generally speaking, you're gonna get longer range. How much longer? Well, the average 2.4 gigahertz system, like I fly Free Sky, and I have flown out to nearly two kilometers. Now, 1.6, 1.8 kilometers, you're still getting, you know, nice solid signal, still works fine. Depends on your setup and, and a few other factors in the environment, but, you know, clear line of sight, nice warm day, low humidity, and you're going to get pretty good range out of a 2.4 gigahertz system. So if you're going to be flying in under a mile, then 2.4 gigs is probably going to do the job just fine and dandy, providing you can always see the model. But if you go UHF, some of the systems will give you probably 80 kilometers or more of range. That's a huge range. I don't know of any models that have the capability of flying a 160 kilometer round trip. That's 80 kilometers out to the limit of range and 80 kilometers back. So generally speaking, these systems should, if they're designed properly, all give you more range than you will ever need, given the state of today's modern model design and the technologies involved in the, the batteries and the motors and so forth. So range probably isn't going to be an issue, but we're going to check that. We're going to make sure that these systems all live up to their claims in terms of providing long range. Now, more consistent control, and this is a big one for me. Uh, don't mistake range for consistency of control. You may have a system that delivers extremely long range, but it may have problems between the limit of range and where you are. There may be all sorts of things. If it is particularly sensitive to interference or whatever, it may, when you fly near an area that there is a lot of noise on the UHF band, the range, it might stop responding, yet go a bit further past that and it might pick up again. So the thing is, we want more consistency of control. I'll be checking for that, but generally UHF should give you more consistency of control when you're dealing with things like terrain. And this is what you know I want to use it for. I fly mini quads. I fly them in forested environments. I fly them on contoured land. The problem with 
2.4 gigahertz is that it's very, very much line of sight. If you cannot see your model, odds are your model cannot hear the transmitter you're holding and you have no control. 2.4 gigahertz is attenuated, you know, it's actually, the signal is severely knocked about by anything that contains moisture, such as a tree, and also buildings, if there's any metal structures in the buildings, and even brick has a high amount of moisture, so that you're going to get the signal really strongly attenuated by anything that gets between you and your model. So if you want to fly proximity through a forest, 2.4 is going to limit how far away you can go through that forestry and through the things that are going to sap up the signal. Likewise, if you're flying on a contoured piece of land and you dip below the hill so you can no longer see the model, that hill is going to be a damn effective block to your 2.4 gigahertz signal. 2.4 gigs doesn't bend around hills very well at all. 433 UHF does a much better job. So if you're flying in a challenging con environmental condition, the UHF should give you more consistency of control. But we'll be checking on that and, you know, as I say with the various systems, we'll, we'll just see how they stack up. But all things being equal, you'll get more consistent control in a harsh environment. Now, more video frequency choice, and this also is a huge one, because most of the people watching this have probably been using 5.8 gigahertz for their video, and that's fine. 5.8 gigahertz has many, many benefits. It's small, it's lightweight, it's cheap. Uh, you can get a lot of people on the 5.8 gigahertz band. You know, four or five people can fly at once on the 5.8 gigahertz band, which is great for racing and things like that. But it doesn't penetrate well. It's a bit like, it's worse than 2.4 gigahertz. If you fly behind a tr couple of trees with 5.8 gigahertz, your signal goes to hell in a handbasket. It really does get snowy and crap and try flying behind four or five trees, well just forget it. It's just not going to help, it's not going to work. So if you want to fly in one of these wooded environments or in a long distance, then 5.8 gigahertz video is just not the right tool for the job. It's, uh, if you, and if you're going to be flying tens of kilometers away, well, 5.8 gigahertz can be made to work, but it then becomes very reliant on having high gain, very directional antennas. So if you lose track of the model, if the tracking fails, then the video disappears like that. What do you do? So therefore, if you want to go long range, you need to not only use a radio system that will reach out there, but a video system that will send a signal back over the same amount of distance. And that's why you need to have more frequency choice. And that's what UHS offers you because 2.4 gigahertz does not play well with frequencies other than 5.8 gigahertz. Obviously, you cannot use a 2.4 gigahertz RC system and a 2.4 gigahertz video system because they'll be trying to compete for the same frequencies. Your video picture will have big lines through it because your transmitter, your radio transmitter is stomping all over it and ruining the signal. And you can't actually use 1.2 gigahertz video effectively, and I'll show you why in a moment when I talk about something called harmonics. So there you go. If you want to use long range, UHF, Radio Gear not only gives you the range to reach out, but enables you to use the right video frequencies to get your video signal back. Very important. And, well, that's basically the pros that I've written down on the board here. Those are the real benefits to using it. So you can see from that, if you need these things, then this might be for you. But there are, it's not all milk and honey in the land of UHF. No, there are some downsides too, and actually the list is longer than the upsides. So let's look at why you, well, what's wrong, what's the downsides of using UHF. And the first one I've listed here is the legality. Now, 2.4 gig is great because there are ISM bands, Industrial Scientific Medical, which is a license-free 2.4 gigahertz band that virtually covers the entire world. Anyone can use it. Some countries are a bit silly, like France, where they have extra additional restrictions, but most countries, you can take a 2.4 gigahertz radio control transmitter and use it without the need for a license, without any kind of vetting. As long as it's compliant equipment, you're away, no problems. 433, different story. There are some parts of the 433 MHz band in, some, in most countries which are license free and you can buy little walkie talkies on them. The little fob you have for arming and disarming your alarms and your car and so forth, they quite often work on 433 on this license free portion of the band, but there are limits of the power you can use on there. And uh, it's also a pretty narrow band. There's not a lot of space. Up on 2.4 gigahertz, you've got 80 megahertz of space to play in. Come down to 433, mm, it's nowhere near as big, so everything gets crammed together, which is why they also limit the power. So when it comes down to that, a lot of the systems that I've looked at briefly in the past, they can be operated quite illegally. They have power levels that exceed the maximum allowed in most countries, and they operate on frequencies outside the part of the band that is license free. So really you shouldn't be using them unless you have a license. And the easiest way to do it is to get a ham license, amateur radio license. That usually provides more bandwidth and you can use your UHF RC system on the ham frequencies as long as you follow a few simple rules and you don't get, you're not breaking the law. The other reason you might want to get a ham license is that some of the video frequencies I was talking about 
also operate in the ham band. So unless you get a ham license, you're not flying legally in many, many cases. So it's well, something well worth looking at. And if there's interest, I may actually talk more about this ham license radio thing, take you through some of the stuff that you would need to learn to get a ham radio license. And really, it's pretty simple stuff. So I could do a how to get your ham license radio video and you could all get your ham licenses and be totally legal and we'd have a party. Next thing, the next con is the size and weight. Now, 2.4 gigahertz technology is amazing. It's brilliant. The size of the receivers, you get little tiny postage stamp sized receivers for indoor stuff. The receivers are used in the mini quads, the D4R2 from FreeSky. Tiny little receiver, fits nicely in there. No, you know, little short aerials because on 2.4 gigahertz, you only need a little short aerial because the wavelength is very short and aerials are one quarter of the wavelength. So they're really short too. So size and weight, is definitely in favor of 2.4 gigahertz. Most of the UHF stuff is a bit bigger and the aerials certainly are longer, which means on a small model, well, you know, it's a bit of a problem. Although, having said that, I know the Easy UHF and Shira long range uh, systems have both put out, I think Dragonlink as well, have all put out little mini receivers for the lighter models for the mini quads and things. So I don't have those to review here. I'm looking just at the stock offerings, but you know, this, point here, it's changing, but the antennas are still going to be longer than on 2.4. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big catch up, but not quite there yet. And interference is another downside. You might say, well, but it's all spe spread spectrum, isn't it? What's the problem? Well, as I said, the 433 megahertz band, especially the legal part, is really much smaller than the 2.4 gigahertz band. And that means the users of the, of the 433 meg band are all crushed up together. So you're more likely to be stomping on someone else and someone else is more likely to be stomping on you. And there's another problem. Remember, if we're flying 50 miles away with our long range system, it stands to reason that our receiver can pick up signals from 50 miles away, which means it's actually able to hear over a, a, a radius of 50 miles all around in every direction. So whereas our 2.4 gig system only works over a mile or so, and therefore your receiver up in your model can only hear things that are a mile away, when you're looking at a 50 mile area, obviously there's a lot more things, potential interference sources out there. So, you know what you gain with one hand, you lose with the other. So, and also because a lot of these uh, things on 433 megahertz are all squished into the band, the potential for interference becomes greater. It's not as bulletproof as 2.4. The other thing is, I'm gonna be looking at when I review these systems is how many UHF RC systems can you run at once? Now you can go out to a field, a busy field, you might find 10, 12, 13, 20 people flying on 2.4 gigahertz, all quite happily flying. And there's no problems because you've got 80 megahertz of bandwidth to deal with, a great big broad spread of the spectrum there you can all fit in quite easily. If you all take one megahertz, then there's 80 people can fly at once, effectively. With 433, you've got a much narrower piece of spectrum to work with. So how many of these UHF RC systems can fly at the same time? That's an important point because if you go out there on a bit of a, a weekend with your mates and you're all flying UHF, it's no good if you find that, hey, we're gonna only fly three at once because then all the systems start interfering with each other. I will do my best to have an investigate and find out which system offers the most ability to work with other systems, be they the same brand or a different brand, at the same place at the same time. And remember also, your receiver can see any other UHF RC operator within a 50 mile radius or more perhaps. So, you know, it's a big point is, is this interference thing. And then there's price. Price, of course. You can buy a Turnergy 9X radio system with a module and a receiver for about 60 bucks. 60 bucks for an eight channel 2.4 gigahertz radio control transmitter and receiver. That is a steal. That is so cheap. I remember when I got into this hobby, my first radio control transmitter was a Futaba 4 channel, or my first proportional set was a Futaba 4 channel. And it cost me $275 back in about 1972. It was a huge amount of money back then. It took me a, a year to save up for that. Now, I can buy the, a, full, a much, much better radio control system with spread spectrum on 2.4 gigahertz for the price of a meal out in an evening. Hi, hey, things have changed. But 2.4, oh, sorry, UHF radio gear is more expensive because it's, there's not a mass market for it. There's the 2.4 gig gear made by Hobby King and all the other people, they're churning out huge numbers of these transmitters and receivers and so forth. So they've got economies of scale. You know, if you make one, it costs so much. If you make 10, it doesn't cost 10 times as much. You get economies of scale, so the price can come down. But these UHF systems are generally made by small manufacturers. Dragonlink, um, Shira is made by Danish Aviation Systems, and you've got Arkbird, it's a Chinese company, but it's not that big. So they're not making large volumes of this stuff because not everyone's using it. Only a very small percentage of the market is using it. So you don't get those economy of scale. So, and some of these things are not necessarily made in China where it's cheap. Some of them are made elsewhere where labor rates are higher. So you're gonna be paying more 
you're gonna be paying more for these systems. And finally, complexity, complexity, 2.4 gigahertz piece of cake, take it out of the thing, stick it in a plane, poke the arrows out the side, bind it up, fly it. So simple. Long range, not quite so simple, because remember, when you're flying long range, you, you can't afford to have brownouts, you can't afford to have momentary losses of signal, you can't afford to have your aerials wrong, because if you're flying in a park and your spectrum receiver browns out and it crashes 100 yards away, you go over and pick up the pieces and you don't think too much of it. If you're flying 50 miles away and your expensive FPV model with this expensive UHF gear in it and your expensive flight controller and your expensive LiPos, if that crashes because the radio link fails, well, it's a bit of a different story. So you, the, the amount of complexity involved means that you know, these systems, to make them more reliable, you've got to know exactly what you're doing. You've got to set them up properly. You've got to make sure that everything's working to spec. So yeah, there's a lot more complexity. That's another downside of the UHF system. So there we go, pros and cons. Look at the list. Decide whether these exceed the value of those, and you'll know whether you should be buying a long-range UHF radio system. It's simple. Okay, let's look at how these long-range systems get their long range. And of course, there is one simple way. If you've got a transmitter and a receiver, then you've got a distance between them. That's you know the range you're flying over. And obviously, because when, you, when a transmitter transmits, it, you tend to use what we call omnidirectional antennas, which means it's like um, throwing a stone into the local pond and the ripples all spread out in big circles, right? Imagine that in three dimensions. You've got a sphere and it's like a, a whole lot of balls, concentric balls on top of each other, uh, built into each other. So you end up with you know this ripples going out in all directions, which means that obviously if we look at it when the signal has traveled a little distance, then the, these little dashes are still fairly close together so we have a strong signal. However, if we look at it when the signal has traveled a big distance, imagine this is the big circle around this thing, you'll see that there's, there's much less of the dots and more of the gap. So the further the signal travels, the more it's diluted because it's expanding. So in that respect, Obviously, the distance has a huge effect on how much signal you're going to get. If your receiver's way over here, you get a really strong signal. If your receiver's way out here, you get a weak signal. And that's why if you keep flying long enough, you fly out of range because the signal gets too weak for the receiver to actually hear. Now, there's two ways, well, there's one easy way to improve the range, isn't there? Just transmit a stronger signal. <laughs> so if you increase the signal here, then obviously the amount of signal there will increase as well. But unfortunately, it's not a proportional, it's not, not, as proportional and also you run into problems you don't want to be spending a whole lot of energy making huge powerful transmissions to reach your receiver it'd be much nicer and it's more practical to come up with a way of increasing the range without having to ramp the power up now to give you an idea what power levels we're talking about your average 2.4 gigahertz system i'll write this over here 2.4 gig system has a 60 milliwatt transmitter in it that's 60 thousandths of a watt, 0.06 watts. It's nothing, it's a piddling amount, it's a tiny amount. And because we have an antenna which has a bit of gain, the little rubber ducky antennas have about two decibels of gain, that means that the 60 milliwatt actually sort of becomes the equivalent of 100 milliwatts. So our little 2.4 gig transmitters are transmitting 0.1 of a watt, 100 milliwatts. And that'll get us about a mile. That's good for about a mile, that's not so bad. So if you wanted to go to two miles, well, we just use 200 milliwatts, 200 milliwatts, wouldn't you? Well, no, you wouldn't, because there's a thing called the inverse square law, a bit of mathematics. Basically, you have to, um, to get twice the range, you have to square the power. So if we wanted to get, if we want to double our range, two times range, we have to use four times the power. So rapidly you run into a law of diminishing returns. Let's say you're getting a mile with your 2.4 gigahertz system and you want to go to two miles. Well, you're going to actually have to go up to 400 milliwatts of affected transmitter power to do that. Hmm, so that's a four times increase. Now you want to go from, say, from uh, two miles to four miles. Well, you'll have to go up to 16 times that 100 milliwatts. It's 1.6 watts. Suddenly, you're getting into big numbers. So you've got 1.6 watts. You're still only getting four miles. So if you wanted to go to 40 miles, well, you do the math, but it's a really big number and it's impractical. It's just impractical. So on 2.4 gigahertz, we're pretty limited in range we can get by boosting the power. So we have to find some other way to get more range if you want to go further. And the best way to do that is to use a different frequency. And I'll explain why. Now, here's something you've probably observed. Now, if there's someone drives past with one of those big loud car stereos, you know, the volume cranked right up and the windows are rattling and their ears are bleeding and you know, their eyes are glazed over and the smoke all through the thing and it smells funny. You know that kind of car and they drive past, what do you hear? You hear, 
hear the bass, the powerful bass banging out. You don't hear the hi-hat cymbal. No, you don't hear that. And it's the same when someone has a party. If they're, you know, half a mile down the street and they've got the stereo cranked right up in the middle of the night and there's music blaring out, you don't hear the high frequencies. You hear the low frequencies. You hear the bass pounding away and the drum beats pounding away. Because what happens is low frequencies carry better than high frequencies. That's right. The lower the frequency, the less energy is lost as it's transmitted. And that's the same for radio waves and it's the same for sound waves. So on 2.4 gigahertz, we're using a really high frequency. It's quite a high frequency and it gets quickly absorbed by the ether around us. It just peters out way quickly. Doesn't it? We can bump up the power to high levels, but it was still losing the power at such a high level as it moves that we're never going to get much in the way of range. But if we go to a lower frequency, if we operate on the base level, then we can get a lot further with the same amount of power. And that's how these UHF systems work. They don't work on 2.4 gigahertz where the signal is so rapidly absorbed. They work on a lower frequency, 433 megahertz. And at that frequency, the absorption rate by the space around us is much, much lower. So we can get much, much further for the same power. And if we raise the power as well, I mean, when we're looking at something that's going to do 50, 60 miles, we're probably going to be running one or two watts of power. But as we saw, one watt of power doesn't get us far on 2.4 gigs, but it'll get us a long way on UHF because instead of losing all that signal, just being absorbed, the signal will carry further. Long, a lower frequency, longer distance. In fact, when they, uh, back in the Cold War, when they wanted to communicate with submarines and that around the, completely around the world before, actually it was before satellites were invented, they used really, really low frequencies that would actually travel right around the world day or night because the lower the frequency, the further the signal would carry. And, uh, you know, that's just the way physics works. That's the way this stuff works. I could put a formula up here called the Freeze Transmission Equation. I might do that later on to show you if you're feeling incredibly math oriented. I'll show you how we calculate and how it works out with the numbers. But in the meantime, take my word for it. The lower the frequency, further the signal carries. That's why UHF is used to give us our long range radio control systems. Okay. I talked about video, the choice of video frequencies, and it's very important, and that's why one of the best reasons for using UHF is because it gives you more choice on your video frequencies. I'm going to explain why that is, and it's all about harmonics. I should write the word harmonics here just to show that I can actually spell harmonics. Anyone who has um, done anything with music will understand harmonics, and what they are, overtones, you've heard of overtones, harmonics. Basically what it means is that nothing in the world is perfect. <laughs> and let's draw a little graph here, let's have, let's, here's frequency, this is frequency. Okay, that's infinity, because it's way up there, in fact I couldn't quite re reach infinity, and here is just amplitude, this is the, the, the size of a signal. Now, let's say we have a frequency, let's just, for, for purposes of the demonstration, we'll say uh, one gigahertz. One gigahertz here, we've got a little signal, Ooh, there it is, one gigahertz signal. And in a, in a perfect world, if we had a transmitter broadcasting on one gigahertz, all that would come out of it is a frequency of one gigahertz. Simple as that. But, but the problem is, we make crap and there's no way to avoid it because nothing's perfect. So you get actually a harmonic. So if we put two gigahertz, three gigahertz, four gigahertz, you'll find that there's actually less power, but still transmitted on two, three, and four gigahertz. These are the harmonics. These are the spurious outputs, as they're called. These are the things we don't want, but we can't really get rid of no matter how hard we try. So it has to be recognized that whenever you make a transmission on a particular frequency, there will be unwanted transmissions on multiples of that frequency, the harmonics. And it's the harmonics here that are the real issue when we try and use certain video frequencies with our RC frequencies. And I'll show you what the problem is. First of all, let's look at the situation most people use when they fly FPV at the moment for you know, close range FPV. 2.4 gigahertz radio transmitter. So there is the signal from the 2.4 gigahertz radio transmitter. And over here is your video transmitter. I'll do that in a different color because video is always a different color. So here's our video transmitter. Woo, there we go. Two signals. Now both of those are going to produce harmonics. They're going to be multiples of those frequencies, unwanted multiples that come out anyway. So two, two times 2.4 is quickly 4.8. Thank you very much. So over here, we're going to have harmonic of 2.4. And of course, we'll have a harmonic of 5.8 out here as well where well, you can't see it, at 11.6 gigahertz. But you notice these harmonics don't get in the way of each other. There's no clash. There's no clash. It's not like the harmonic here is interfering with that. No, they're all completely well spaced. So 5.8 gigahertz video works really well with 2.4 gigahertz RC. No problems at all. But let's have a look at what happens when you want to use a different video frequency with your 2.4.
Let's suppose that you want to use 2.4 gigahertz for your radio control, but you want to get longer range. Remember I said the lower the frequency, the longer the range for a given power. So 5.8 gigahertz gets rapidly absorbed by the environment, doesn't go very far at all. It's that really, really high treble note that just dissipates so quickly you can't hear it. That's why 5.8 gigahertz video systems are generally limited to a mile or two maximum unless you start using really high gain antennas and lots of power. So 5.8 gigahertz is a short range video frequency. A longer range video frequency will be lower. So if we drop down from there, we can have 1.2 gigahertz. And you think, oh, that's a lot lower than 5.8. We'll get a lot further. So, you know, I might be able to, you know, use it with my 2.4 gig radio. If I use more power on my 2.4 gig, who knows? But no, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work because this is what's going to happen. Here is our 1.2 gigahertz video signal in red again. And as I mentioned, multiples, harmonics. Well, what is, this, is the harmonic of 1.2? 1.2 times 2 is 2.4. Now here we have a clash. We've got a clash between the two frequencies. Our video transmitter, the unwanted harmonic out of the video transmitter, will stomp all over the very weak signal your receiver is getting from your RC transmitter. So your range will go to hell in a handbasket. You'll find, whoa, and I've proven this. I've taken a free sky system that normally gives me well over a mile's range. I have put a 1.2 gigahertz video transmitter on the model, and the range was reduced to about 500 meters. It just completely destroyed it. it. It brought it down to a third because that harmonic was just stomping all over my signal. I'll have to take a support call. One moment, please. And I'm back. Bottom line, can't use 1.2 with 2.4. Ain't gonna work. Um, another popular video frequency, of course, is 2.4 gigahertz for video. Um, you can buy 2.4 gigahertz video systems everywhere. But I think it's pretty easy to see what the problem's gonna be there. If you're running 2.4 gig as your radio system and you put a 2.4 gig video system on, well, it's gonna be 10,000 million times worse. And so it's not gonna work either. As you can see, this 2.4 gigahertz RC frequency is really restricting the choice of video frequencies. Another thing you can use, of course, there's, another ni there's a 900 megahertz band down here, but it's really not a good band to use because 900 megahertz is, uh, Put it down here. It's illegal in many countries because of, it falls on the GSM cell phone band and the antennas are getting really big. You're getting 900 megahertz, getting big antennas as practical considerations there. And a lot of the 900 megahertz gear, to be honest, it's crap. It's cheap Chinese rubbish that's rolled out, you know, at a low price. It doesn't perform that well. 1.2 gigahertz is some really good quality video gear rolled out. I've got some on the bench I'll be testing later. I'll include it as a part or an addendum to this UHF stuff because no good telling you all about the UHF, UHF radios if I don't also look at some of the video systems that will work with them. So let's now take a look at what we can do if we've got 433 megahertz as our RC frequency. Here's our 433 megahertz RC system, okay? Now, obviously you can see because harmonics only occur above the fundamental, as it's called, the actual required frequency, we can use any of these frequencies because all their harmonics will be somewhere over here. 1.2 will have a harmonic at 2.4, 2.4 would have a harmonic at 4.8, 5.8 is gonna have a harmonic at 11.6. They're not gonna interfere with anything we do. We can use any of these video frequencies with impunity. No problems at all. Ooh, so now we get to choose the frequency we want. And quite honestly, most of the time it will be 1.2. So there you go. Um, we don't have a problem. All these little bits here can do their thing. And the harmonics, I don't care because it's not going to interfere. We're only interested in what's going to hit this. Nothing is going to hit our RC frequency. Our video frequencies won't affect us. At this stage, we've just been looking at what happens when you've got this video transmitter on the model next to the receiver, the RC receiver on the model. We've only been interested in looking at the harmonic content of the video transmitter and how it might affect the RC receiver. But remember, we have a similar situation going on back on the ground at the ground station because we have got a big loud transmitter in the form of our UHF RC system and a sensitive receiver in the form of our video receiver. So we need to look at how the, the harmonics interact there too and this is a potential source of problem for these long range UHF systems if you're using 1.2 gigahertz or 1.3 gigahertz for your video because there is a little band here which people use it's sort of 1.2 through to 1.3 and there's a number of channels in there not many but there's a few channels you can use in there so let's do this harmonic thing again here is our 433 megahertz signal from our RC system this time and there's going to be harmonics first harmonic there is going to be at 866 megahertz we don't care we're not using that but then you've got the third harmonic hmm what happens with the third harmonic? you know the 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 three times this original frequency what frequency is that going to be on well i did a little bit of sum with my calculator and it says it's on uh, 1.299 gigahertz which is up here it's actually right in here whoa which is a bit of a problem because 
our video signal is going to be somewhere in here too. Right? So we have the potential here with these harmonics for the UHF radio control transmitter to start interfering with the video signal at the ground station end. If this transmitter, if our UHF transmitter doesn't have really good harmonic suppression, filtering on the output, then we're going to get really bad, bad lines all over our video because the, the harmonics will clobber it. So there's a problem at both ends. We can get around the problem at the model end by using 433, the UHF RC and the 1.2 gigahertz video, but on the ground station end, everything, everything is going to depend on how well this transmitter, the tra RC transmitter is made, and how well the video receiver is made. If the filtering in here is no good, then it's going to clobber the video. And if the filtering in the video receiver is no good, then it could still be clobbered. So look closely at that and examine the transmitters on the radio control side and the receivers on the video side to work out how they coexist and whether they can coexist and which of these long range systems produces the least harmonic output so is going to produce the least problems with our video signal on the ground. Very important thing. So yeah, covered a lot of ground already. I hope you're keeping up. If not, um, pause the video, have a cup of coffee and come back later. But we will move on because I dropped my piece of paper as I always do. And what else have I got here? Oh yes, interference rejection. Let's take a look at that. Now there are two primary types of interference. is what we call in-band interference and out-of-band interference. What does it mean? Well, our receiver is obviously going to be listening, our long-range RC receiver is going to be listening to a band of frequencies, the, four, the UHF band. It'll be listening in there, looking out for our transmitter and picking up the signal, processing it and using that to control the servos. So, but sometimes there are going to be other things operating on the 433 megahertz band. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there. So we need to make sure, need to test these systems to make sure they can reject other signals that are legitimately in the same band, but they and things that the system shouldn't be responding to. These could be keychain fobs, there could be other people flying other UHF radio systems, they could be walkie-talkies, there could be all sorts of stuff. We need to make sure that the systems that I'm testing have an adequate rejection of in-band interference. So I'll be testing for that. But there's also out-of-band, and that's another one that's actually quite important. I talked before about the video transmitter interfering with the RC receiver, and I said once you get onto the um, UHF side of things, no real problems because the harmonics of the video transmitter are well above the frequency of the RC system. But there is another problem. If you have a receiver that suffers from out, poor out of band rejection, then you can still have a video transmitter on a completely different frequency, reducing your range by doing what, what's called desensitizing the receiver. And I'll give you an example of how that works. You're at a party, you're chatting quietly to someone there, you know, just low, hushed tones, hushed tones, talking to a, a pretty girl at the party and you're discussing what you're going to do afterwards and you know, does she want to come for coffee? And you can both hear each other, you can both make sense of what each other is saying, even though you're speaking quietly. Then suddenly someone turns on the stereo and winds the volume right up, rarely rattles the windows. Now, if you carry on talking, you're not speaking any softer, but you can't hear what the other person's saying, even though they're not talking to you. And the problem is that you've got this really, really loud noise that's just completely deafening you. And with radio control or with radio systems, if you have a strong enough signal, even if it's on a completely different frequency, it deafens your receiver because the, the, the signal is so strong, it just overloads the front of the receiver and the receiver can't hear your signal, even though it's on a different frequency. So this out of band rejection is something that is important when you've got something like a really powerful video transmitter right next to a very sensitive radio control receiver. And I'll be testing for this. We're looking at the thresholds when these receivers start losing their ability to hear the transmitter because there's a really strong signal nearby. And so we'll do that. That's a test I haven't seen anyone else do on these long range UHF systems. Now, so also test the in-band uh, interference rejection. As I said, this is even more critical with our UHF system than our 2.4 gig system because the 2.4 gig system only has a range of about a mile. So the receivers out there can hear things that are all within a mile's radius. You know, the long range, it can hear for 80 miles in all directions. So there's a lot more out there that can potentially interfere with it. So the ability to reject that interference is pretty critical. It also boils down to how they've done their spread spectrum. Is it frequency hopping? Is it direct sequence? These things will also affect the ability to reject, especially in-band interference sources. Interesting stuff. It'll be exciting to see how these things perform. I'm really quite keen to have a close look at them and see if they stack up. So there you go. I hope I have explained to you, you know, basically what goes on behind this UHF stuff, how it differs from the 2.4 gigahertz, the things you need to know to make an informed decision as to whether you even bother with UHF. And what I'll be doing in the coming videos is, as I say, reviewing each individual system. And I'll be looking a bit more closely at the basics. 
doing a proper install with this UHF stuff, setting stuff up properly and checking to make sure once you've installed it that everything is working well. Because for example, I talked about interference. One source of interference that people sometimes don't even think about is the high definition recording camera you might be using on your FPV model. Some of these cameras spew out huge amounts of noise on the UHF band and that means that the receiver won't be able to hear your transmitter because there's a much noisier conversation. There's the stereo blaring in the room while I try and listen to this faint conversation 80 miles away, things like that. We're going to be looking not only at the radio control systems, but other potential sources of noise, such as these HD recording cameras. And there's a surprising number of things that will spew out noise on the UHF band. We'll try and identify those, look at ways of mitigating the effect that has on your range. And also the tools that are provided by some of these long range systems. Some of them even provide you with the ability to do a spectral analysis. So they'll actually listen to the band they operate on and draw a little graph showing you if there's any noise there. Brilliant idea, wonderful piece of thing, because not everybody has a spectrum analyzer like I do. So there you go, there's, there's some really good innovations gone into some of these products. So that's about it for this video, it's been too long anyway, and I thank you for watching. If you've got questions, comments, anything to say, put it in the space provided by YouTube below the description and I will do my best to address it. And if you've got things you particularly want to see in the review process, let me know. I've done quite a bit of the reviews, but it's not too late to add a little bit to some of those things. And if there's any things you'd like to add to what I've put here, because hey, you may have another pro or another con to the use of UHF that I didn't put on the board there, and if you want to see any specific direction taken, once we've got the reviews out of the way, then tell me because I, I want to do this stuff to suit the needs of the people who are watching it. There you go. Thank you for watching. Fly safely and come back soon because we'll be starting to look at these things on the bench for a start, give you an idea of what's good and what's crap. Thanks for watching. It's time for me to get back to the whiteboard.